Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Cook, and I'd like to welcome you to the virtual 2021 Tucson Festival of Books. The Tucson Festival of Books is made possible by more than 200 sponsors and more than 2,000 local volunteers. Special thanks to the Arizona Daily Star, the University of Arizona, and Tucson Medical Center, the festival's three presenting sponsors. This panel is sponsored by Western National Parks Association and the Sandoff, Sandroff family. Keep up to date with our events. Sign up for the festival newsletter at tucsonfestivalofbooks.org. Joining us today is Helen McDonald. Helen McDonald is a writer, poet, naturalist, and historian of science. Her book, H is for Hawk, won many prizes, including the Samuel Johnson Prize for nonfiction, the Costa Book of the Year, the Prix des Milieux Livres Estrangers in France. I warned Helen I would butcher that title, by the way. Uh, and Helen was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Kirkus Prize for nonfiction. She is a frequent contributor to the New York Times Magazine and lives in Suffolk, England, where she's joining us right now live uh, from Suffolk. Helen McDonald, uh, welcome to the virtual Tucson Festival of Books. Darn it, I wish you were here in person, um, but someday uh, we will see you here, I hope. I would love that. I was just sort of thinking about that, looking out of the window at this sort of scouring gray, cold English sky thinking, I really wish I was in Tucson, but it's great to be here virtually and thank you for this and thank you for everyone who's come along. Uh, well, Helen, you know, I hate to say it, but it's going to be, I think, in the 70s, maybe even 80 today here in Tucson. So okay. I'm half Scottish and half Irish, so any temperature above about 69 and I start to go pink. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm fine. Well, as we chatted before the session, uh, we hope to see you here someday. Um, just a final bit of business for our audience. Uh, I will want to remind everyone that you can ask questions. Uh, and if you, uh, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you can see that there's a chat function. And we will do our best to monitor the questions and get to your questions if we can. Um, Helen and I talked a little bit. And what we'd like to do is, um, roughly speaking, have about 45 minutes where we feature Helen. Um, and she will read a little bit and um, uh, talk about her book and and um, uh, uh, and then probably for the last 15 minutes or so we'll we'll uh, entertain questions. So Helen, just to to get started, um, you know your 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 book in your introduction, you you called it uh, a, a wonder comer. Um, and you want to talk a little bit about th that concept and and kind of what what's behind that. Yeah, I'd love to. So, um, well, I, I guess, you know, the Ages for Hawk, if any anyone uh, watching this has read it, is a, is a memoir. And um, this is a very different book. It's a collection of essays. And um, they're about very different subjects and they're in very different styles. Um, there's everything in there from, you know, going to Chile with a bunch of space scientists. There's an essay about migraine, essays about watching birds on the Empire State Building, all kinds of stuff. And I thought when I was putting it together, you know, is how do these essays talk to one another? Because they seem to kind of have themes that, that continue throughout. And I suddenly remembered something from my old days as a historian of science, and that was this wonderful um, early modern thing, the Wunderkammer, the Cabinet of Curiosities. And basically it was a kind of early personal museum, like a case full of objects. And these objects would be not arranged according to the ways that museums arrange things now. So you'd have these wildly different things next to each other, you know, everything from, you know, um, things from different cultures, pieces of art, um, religious icons, feathers, skulls, bones, stuffed animals. And the point of them was that you could pick these things up and look at them and touch them, but also see the way they related to one another, the differences and the similarities. And the whole point of them was to inst instill wonder an awe, an amazement in the in the viewer, and I thought, you know, the natural world, you know, that's what I this book is trying to do in many ways, rather than sort of, um, you know, shout at people to do certain things in relation to it. It's it's basically offering the natural world to the reader, saying, look what is here, look what is out there, you know, pay attention, and 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 there's so much love in this book, and I wanted that wonder to irrigate its pages. So yeah. 
Give me a metaphor and I'll run with it. That's how I work. So I well, you, you uh, very effectively uh, did that in your book. It's a lovely book. I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. And uh, how wonderful for you to share your your uh, behind the scenes thinking and, and thoughts today. And we're going to ask you to read a little section here in a moment. But uh, can you talk about the title Vesper Flights and, you know, what, what what's behind that? I love the word Vesper. It's a it's a great word, Latin for evening. Um, and Vesper flights, Vespers are the, the last prayers of the day um, in certain um, Christian denominations. But Vesper flights is actually a scientific term for these astonishing um, aerial ascents that common swifts make. Common swifts, um, you know, have swifts in 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 America. These are very different species, but very aerial, like like chimney swifts. And um, every dawn and dusk, these birds climb thousands of feet up into the sky in vast flocks and um, they go so high that you know you, they, they disappear from view and people always thought they were doing that in order to sleep on the wing but it turns out that they come back down again uh, at night and they feed in the dark and scientists have kind of worked out that what they're doing on these vector flights is um, going so high they can they can orient themselves and they use this wonderfully romantic sort of suite of strategies to do that. They they look at the disposition of the stars, they can see polarized light patterns that are very clear at dawn and dusk. Um, they can see hundreds of miles, they can see clouds on the horizon, they can feel the winds of large scale weather systems that are coming towards them. And basically they're working out what's gonna happen next and where they can go. So this whole essay is about basically being a community and looking on the horizon to see what's coming and I wrote it before COVID, before the pandemic, and now I read it and I think, oh my God, you know, it's it's weirdly prophetic. It feels like an essay that's talking about the grimness of this year. It was a really amazing um, uh, thing to write. And I think one of the things it does is what I try and do all the time, which is to say, you know, science doesn't detract from the wonder of the world. It actually just increases it. The more you know, the more amazing it is. Couldn't agree more. And again, you capture that essence so well in your writing. I, I found that particular essay fascinating. And, and uh, you, you've been recognized by uh, critics for your blending of genres. And, and uh, I, I very much appreciate that. Um, so I think maybe it would be wonderful to hear you read uh, a passage or two from your book. I'd love to. Um, and I'm going to read about this, this as you this is the cover. This is the this is the bird I'm talking about. These birds are, as I said, very aerial. They have tiny feet. In fact, their Latin name, uh, the, the the genus Arquus, means footless, because they're so tiny. They can't perch. They when the young birds leave the nest, they fly continually for two to three years. They never perch. They never land. They never touch anything. It's incredibly weird. They inhabit the sky a bit like you know fish inhabit the sea. And I have a friend who rears orphan baby swifts, and I had the opportunity to uh, release one of these birds that she had reared. And she was keeping these birds in a little kind of plastic pet carrier. And I got to hold up this baby swift to the air and wait for it to make its first flight. So I'm going to read what that was like. It was a very emotional experience. It stares into the wind for a while, then starts shivering. Anticipation, I think. Functional explanations, this bird is warming up its pectoral muscles ready for flight. Emotional explanations, anticipation, wonder, joy, and terror. The sensitive plumes growing between the feathers of its wings and slides are being brushed by the breeze and feeling their element for the first time. Nothing has visibly changed, but something is happening, like an aircraft avionic system coming online as it powers up. Blinking lights, engine check, check. But that doesn't work though, not quite as an analogy, because what I am watching is a new thing making itself out of something else. There is no doubt in my mind that this is as much a transformation as a dragonfly larva crawling from water and tearing itself out into a thing with wings. On my open palm, a creature whose home has been paper towels and plastic boxes is turning into a different creature whose home is thousands of miles of air. Then the swift decides. It tilts the pug-sharp tiny tip of its beak upwards, arches its back, and drops from my flattened palm, making an aching series of stiff and creaky wing beats. 
For five or six seconds, everything feels wrong. The bird is a mere foot above the grass and my heart is beating fast. Up, 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 calls Judith. But nothing is broken. We are just watching a bird learning to fly. Hitching as if pulling into gear, the swift starts to ascend, flickering up and up into a sky streaked with evening cirrus. It describes one careful circle above our heads, then lifts even higher and straight lines it to the south. And I look down at my palm and there's a little scratch on the meat of my thumb where its claws had gripped tight, gripped tight to the hand that was the last solid thing the bird would touch for years. It was very emotional. <laughs> I'm afraid I've lost your voice, Jim. Uh -oh. oh, there we go oh. again. Okay, good. Let's good. Blame, blame English Wi-Fi. I'm sorry if anyone else has had a problem. Okay, that's an easy one. We'll we'll do that. Well, wonderful. And and not are are you only not only are you a great writer, but uh, you're a wonderful reader too. Oh, all, yeah. those, all those days lecturing, I think, help. Well, wonderful. So, um, you. Um, uh, you know, so so many different themes that I picked up on in the book, um, but one thing that I, I uh, touched on was uh, this notion of literature as a call to action. And you know, we we know that it we as a human species uh, we need to conserve our planet and and uh, and and take action. Um, so tell me a little bit more about your your thinking of, of uh, literature as a call to action. Absolutely. Um, I am not very good at um, being um, a writer that tells people what to do. I'm not a very good campaigning writer. It's not what I do. It's, it's not my thing. There is an absolute urgency and a need for those kinds of books. Um, so I looked at what I do and what I can do, and I thought about what would be helpful and sometimes i think of this book a little bit as being like you know those people who stand by the side of the road where people are running marathons and they hand out drinks um i just hope it, the book works a little bit like that you know we all know that no one will want to preserve anything or, or protect anything or fight to to keep things running unless they know those things and love them so my job was to try and draw attention to the complexity and beauty of things out there. And I hope also that the book um, helps with hope. It's very easy to become paralyzed by despair, facing, you know, we are in the sixth great extinction, biodiversity loss and the climate emergency is absolutely terrifying. And I feel that when, when one's utterly despairing, one doesn't do anything because one feels there's no point. And of course, if one's optimistic, one doesn't do anything because one doesn't really think there's a problem. So I think, you know, like Rebecca Solnit says, the, the, the job is to open up a space for uncertainty and, and hope, because that's where we have to fight and march. So, you know, on the page, I think I want to just point out and show with love what's there. But off the page, I'm up, I'm up for a bit of marching. Yes, <laughs> I really am. That's, that's where it needs to be. We need to come together collectively and fight that hell for what there is. Well, you know, one of the uh, beautiful things about literature and art is it connects people emotionally to um, very complex issues. And I think that uh, your writing does that so well. And, and um, you know, another theme that I think is quite remarkable to me, and I, I feel uh, throughout much of the book, is, is this um, fundamental essence of wonder that you describe and these particular moments where you have some revelation um, and uh, motivated you to take action and, and to write about it. So can you talk a little bit about just, you know, that essence of wonder that, that we all have, it's something that we all share, I think, uh, as a human species and, and how, how that translates into action. Yeah, I, I tried to write about those moments for a long time. In fact, I ended up writing a whole essay about how difficult that was. Um, so when I was writing Hs for Hawk, I kept trying to um, communicate. And I'm sure, you know, everyone uh, watching this has had those moments in the natural world when some suddenly um, there is a, a huge rush of sort of awe 
at what you're seeing of, of, of amazement. It can be quite a small thing that you see. It doesn't have to be, a, a, you know, it doesn't have to be Niagara Falls or a mountain. It can be a feather swinging on a cobweb in the sun. And I tried to write about those moments using the philosophical language of the sublime, which was, you know, took me some of the way there. And I discovered, you know, eventually the only way to write about these things is to really, you know, be brave and use religious and, you know, uh, terminology because these moments to me seem like moments of grace. There's, you know, I'm not a, I, I don't have faith. I was raised in a deeply atheistic household. But those moments when you feel there's something present that's communicating with you about the wider complexity of the world, the astonishment that we are here at all, that any of us are alive to see this, that we're made of the stuff of stars. How could you not use that language? So I, I, I use that language now, this, this word numinous, this sense that um, any of us at any moment could encounter something which can almost stop time. And it can be, they, these moments can be deeply um, life-changing. You know, um, and they can really uh, ground one in the sense that um, there is a, a gravity and solemnity to what we're doing to the planet that we need to step up and, and, and work with. You know, we need to work with it. There's an amazing line from Robin Wall Kimmerer. She wrote in Braiding Sweetgrass that she was teaching a bunch of students once, and she said to them, you know, the, the, the thing about natural, you know, nature books is that they tend to operate according to what's called declensionist narratives it's a great word it means you know no one knows what it means i only found out recently but declensionist narratives are narratives of everything getting worse and worse and worse and of course we have to write like that and so all these students were saying you know everything's a disaster everything we touch turns to ash and she said to them what would it be like to feel that the earth loved you back and that, that line has stayed within me. You know, I can't stop thinking about it. And that's really what I'm hoping that part of my book, um, it, it, it walks towards that place. What would it be like to feel that reciprocity? Yeah. Yes, that, I think that was one of my favorite essays, actually, towards the end of the book, uh, The Numinous Ordinary. And, and I love the story of the uh, radio. Uh, do you want to tell the audience a little bit more about about that and yeah yeah uh, it's great i had this um, kid a shortwave radio and it was like a proper blocky 1960s lump you know back in the day when technology was like expensive you know it was made of kind of rosewood and um you know i used to listen to it as a kid i'd turn the dial through all through the, you know, the across the dial and, and hear the kind of stuttering chattering kind of hisses of all these different um radio stations you know, i was obsessed with it and um, it was really exciting. It kind of made Europe into an idea for me. And and then like what one I used to occasionally when I was hearing the radio many years later, I'd hear this weird melody in the background, this five or ten note melody, and I didn't know what it was. And I used to get, try and find this melody. It would drift in in the evenings in this incredibly impossible remote way behind the speech or whatever I was listening to. And I discovered years later that it was the interval signal of a Russian radio station, Radio Mayak, Radio Lighthouse. And it was, um, you know, and I just, you know, this, this essay talks a lot about how um, what was beautiful about that was it was a conjunction of human technology and will and hope with the conditions of the atmosphere, the ionosphere. Um, so, and I think for me, that sense of the sublime and the numinous happens very often when we have human attempts at art and communication that, that meet these extraordinary natural systems. And it's where they collide, I think, that the excitement for me comes. It was a cool radio. I don't know what happened to it. I think it probably ended up in a, in a you know, in a skip in a or a, in a trash place somewhere. I'm very sad about it being gone. Wonderful that you captured that memory so lovely, uh, so well in the book. So Helen, um, you know, I, I found there were moments, I don't know if this is the right term, but sort of Zen, if you will, uh, you know, this, these moments that you expressed um, and shared with us, your readers. Um, and uh, it's interesting, you know, your, your background, uh, science, um, history of science, uh, steeped in, in the discipline of science. Uh, but one quote that really struck me was the world might be too complicated for us to know uh, that adds new dimensions i think to uh, uh you know scientific thinking perhaps what tell tell us a little bit more about that that moment 
in Sex, Death, and Mushrooms essay. That was such a, such a tabloid newspaper headline. I loved that one. Yes, um, and I first heard this from a um, actually a, 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 an ecologist who was working in tropical forests, and he just turned to me once and he said, "The thing about tropical forests is you think you under, you know you might be able to understand them." It's like you know the early ecologists worked on incredibly simple ecosystems. You know they went to kind of Arctic islands where there were three birds and you know four kinds of you know mammals and whatever. Um, it's so complicated. It's it's possible that our human minds cannot comprehend what is going on there. And I, I thought about that with mushrooms. The, 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 the fungal world, the world of fungi is, is so challenging to our sense of not only the world, but who we are. You know, some of these um, organisms have, you know, 78 different sexes. You know, I think all the sort of panic about gender. I mean, come on, guys, you know, um, and the sheer profusion of what's, you know, the amount of life that's in soil. I think, you know, the, the you know, billions and billions of cells in, in a tablespoon of, of, of earth and the way in which these complicated networks of, of fungal threads are connecting not only each other, but trees and plants in this sort of stitched network, which involves a kind of exchange of, of water and minerals, but also a kind of communication, a chemical communication between these very different organisms. You know, we have no idea what's going on when we walk around. And I love that because, um, and it's something I talk about a little bit more in terms of when we watch animals. I think one of the great magical things that watching animals can do is that moment when you realize that the world the animal sees and inhabits is not ours. It has a completely different life world you know, the spiders on the walls or the deer in the forest, they have a different world from us. And when you start to think about that, the world kind of ramifies into, you know, an unimaginable number of different worlds and we're just living in one of them. And I find that really, really moving and quite dizzyingly exciting to think about. It really is. Yeah, I, I share that, you know, the sense of wonder remains and, and just this idea that not everything is explainable. Um, some people might find discouraging, but I, I think it, it is part of our human condition and, and uh, helps inspire us and helps us move forward, yeah. perhaps. Helen, would you like to take a, a, a few more minutes and read from another passage of your book? Uh, is there anything in particular you would like? There are many, many, many places. I'm not going to read the goat one. That's got a rude word in it. <laughs> There's lots of places. Um, I could read this clips bit. There's a, a wonderful bit. Uh, I, if anyone um, who is watching this has seen a total eclipse, um, will know. Um, I have seen a few of them now, and they're all mind blowing. And um, I remember talking to a man who uh, I was going on and on about, you know, how astonishing they are. And he was like, yeah, they can't be that, they can't be that amazing. And then he went to see one and he rang me and he said, I'm very, very sorry. I cried. <laughs> so I'm going to read a little bit about what it's like to see a total eclipse in a clear sky. Okay. The land is orange, the sea is purple, Venus has appeared in the sky quite high up to the right. And then with a chorus of cheers and whistles and applause, I stare at the sky as the sun slides away and the day does too. And impossibly, impossibly above us is a stretch of black, soft black sky and a hole in the middle of it. A round hole darker than anything you've ever seen fringed with an intensely soft ring of white fire. Applause crackles and ripples across the dunes. My throat is stopped and my eyes fill with tears. Goodbye, intellectual apprehension. Hello, something else entirely. Totality is so incomprehensible to your mental machinery that your physical response becomes hugely apparent. You cannot grasp any of this. Not the dark nor the sunset clouds on every horizon, not the stars, just that extraordinary wrongness up there that pulls the eyes towards it. The exhilaration is barely contained terror. There are no human words fit to express all this. Big binary oppositions and grand narratives break everything and mend it at the same time. Sun and moon, darkness and light, sea and land, breath and no breath, life, death. A total eclipse makes history laughable, makes you feel both precious and disposable, makes the inclinations of the world incomprehensible, like someone trying to engage a stone 
in discussions about the price of a celebrity magazine. I am dizzy and my skin crawls. Everything's fallen away. There's a hole in the sky where the sun should be. I sink to the ground and stare up at the hole in the sky and the dead world around me is a perfect vision of the underworld of my childhood imagination. And then something else happens, a thing that still makes my heart rise in my chest and my eyes blur, even in recollection. For it turns out there's something even more affecting than watching the sun disappear into a hole, watching the sun climb out of it. Here I am sitting on the beach in the underworld with all the standing dead. It's cold and a loose wind blows through the darkness. But then, from the lower edge of the blank black disk of the dead sun bursts a perfect point of brilliance. It leaps and burns. It's unthinkably fierce, unbearably bright. Something, I blush to say it, but here it comes, like a word. And thus begins the world again. Instantly, joy, relief, gratitude, an avalanche of emotions. Is all made to rights now? Is all remade? From a bay tree struck into existence a moment ago, a spectacled bulbul calls a greeting to the new dawn. It was pretty great. Very lovely. <laughs> Very lovely. The imagery is is uh, remarkable. And uh, I, was, I was right there with you when I read oh, that. I, it was amazing. I, I was there. We, we, we were near, it, this was in Sida. Turkey, and I remember reading a, 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 a NASA guide to how to see an eclipse. And there was this amazing section, which I felt very American at the time, about how you shouldn't look at the sun without eye protection because it might damage your vision and that would affect your future earning potential. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, there was a full eclipse in North America a few years ago, and sadly we weren't able to experience it, but we know a number of people that did and, and had very similar impact on them, uh, very life-changing in some ways. So another passage that I really loved, um, Helen, was your experience uh, traipsing around the Altiplano in Chile. Um, uh, some great stories, some remarkable people that you were with, and some moments that were um, appear very profound to you. Um, I was off my face. I had, you know, it was incredibly high. There, was, there wasn't much, much oxygen. I kept getting deja vu. And, and you know, I, I remember just thinking, this is like a really spiritual, weird place. I, keep, I, I saw this llama once come from behind a rock, and I was convinced I'd seen it throughout my life, you know, again and again and again. And I ended up talking to the doctor on the expedition and said, is, is deja vu a symptom of altitude? And he was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank goodness. It was incredible. Place. Sorry, I put it in. No, no. I, I just I, I was hoping that you would expand a little bit about your experience there and and some of the uh, more uh, profound moments. I think that you you wrote about in that in that essay. That was one of the um, most astonishing months of my life, and that was a actually a commission from the New York Times magazine. Bless them. I, I worked with a wonderful editor called Sasha Weiss there, who's an absolute you know, genius. And she she asked me to do a, a biographical feature about this extraordinary woman called Natalie Capol, who is the head of the SETI Institute, um, which as many of you know, is the institute which looks for signs of life in the universe. And there was an expedition that was a SETI and NASA astrobiology, <laughs> Astro, I'm not been drinking, that's just <laughs> astrobiology institute. Um, and what they do is, is to test ways of finding biosignatures which might be sort of evidence of life on Mars. You know, Mars is probably dead now, but you know, before there was a great climatic change there a few years ago, there may well have been life there. And to find evidence of that, you want to go to an environment that is as close to Mars as you can get on Earth. And it turns out that one of those environments is the very high, very dry Atacama Desert in Chile. So I went up there with this bunch of amazing people to, 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 to test all these things, you know, robots and drills and, and, and various sort of ways of mapping and looking inside, you know, things. And, and a lot of their, their work, in fact, was is now on the um, Perseverance rover, is, is carrying a lot of this, this, this technology. And it was, in, it was amazing, you know, there, there were these uh, huge salt lakes, crystalline salt lakes, and um, you'd pick up a lump of this salt. It looked a bit like, you know, when the, 
you probably don't in Tucson, but the side of the road after there's been snow, you have this weird kind of crumply, refrozen, horrible brown, sloppy, snowy eyes. It looked like that, but like, you know, miles of it. And you pick up these lumps of salt, and if you looked at them against the light, you see kind of a strip of darkish pigment, and then above that, a strip of reddish pigment. And these were um, bacteria that were living inside these lumps of salt. And the red one, it's very cool, the red one, um, the reddish pigment is actually sunscreen, um, protecting the bacteria below. They live in these, these little kind of commensal organistic kind of, uh, you know, colonies. And I realized, you know, this lifeless landscape, everywhere you look was life. And I think one of the things that brought home to me was, you know, I am a little bit confused about why so many giantly expensive um, uh, rich people are desperate to take us all to Mars. You know, there's more life in, you know, a millimeter of salt from an arid, apparently lifeless desert than there is on all of Mars. And why would you, why would we want to go there when we have all this? It, that was a really, that was a big moment for me, that, that, that bewilderment as to why Mars is. It's like the, the frontier. Why would we want to go there when there's, it's, you know, inimical to life. It's a very, very, very harsh environment. But, you know, people. Right, right. Well, again, I think um, a, a, one of the uh, uh, quotes from your book, if I have it right, is um, a moment where you stated you uh, understood everything, but that there is also nothing to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about that, that juxtaposition and, and uh, what was behind that thought? Yeah, it's, it's um, those moments, I mean, human minds are really extraordinary. You know, you have those sort of intimations of um, almost oceanic feelings that you kind of get it, you get it all. Um, but they often come along with also a very sharp understanding of how limited our brains are and how we don't understand things. Um, and in terms of understanding, I know I'm pushing this question a little bit away from where you're going, but I think one of the things the book tries to do a lot is to interrogate really carefully why we value certain creatures and landscapes the way we do. Um, you know, one of the things that there's a great line from the poet Baudelaire, which I think was stolen by the film, The Usual Suspect. You know, the greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince us he didn't exist. And we do this with nature. You know, we are brought up to believe that there's, you know, nature is the one refuge from human meaning. But it turns out we, we, we pack it full of our meaning. It's the, it's the safest place for it. Because if we, if we see our meanings there, we pretend they're natural. It's a bit like I remember when the first, when the second Gulf War happened, there were all these sort of flights of um, American jets around the borders of, of you know, of Iraq. And, and it was like, you know, it's just like hawks, you know, we're just patrolling our territory. You know, it's that, it's that kind of movement. And um, I think that trying to understand these hidden meanings that we give the natural world is really crucial because, of course, we make conservation decisions quite often on things that are not based on science. And we need the science. But the book is also a plea to try and understand why we feel, for example, that, um, you know, um, a spider is something we shouldn't really bother about, but a snow leopard is pretty cool. I mean, they're both animals, you know, they're a goshawk, you know, from my first book, you know, we might think there are these things of death and mystery and kind of Nordic forest, but they're basically just chickens with talons. I mean, they're just birds. So trying to find those meanings is really important to me. And I yep. think it's conservation um it's really important so picking up on an, another theme that um i found in the book uh this this connection of human and natural heritage kind of in parallel and and also almost a, a blurring of the two yeah. um can you can you expand on that just a little bit um the blurring sorry the blurring of at one point, you you talked about Nash the 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 history of of England, for example. Uh, particularly, I was remembering World War Two and and um, uh, in parallel with natural history and and sort of this this toggling back and forth. It was it was quite fascinating, Helen. Yeah, it's very uh, very close to my heart. This this question, as a nature writer, you know, it's a, it's it can't help but be a very political act. Um, I think particularly now, uh, it's really important to bring that to the fore. And as you know, there's been a great upsurge in certain forms of nationalism and populism um, across the West. And um, sometimes 
quite often these you have the situation where the, the the landscape is considered home by some groups of people by virtue of ancestry and quite often that's a very exclusionary act right you know you can't be at home here you're not from here you don't you know your family wasn't from here and i think that the, the nature writing and writing about the natural the natural world is quite often doesn't look at that as clearly as i think it should so in britain for example you know i i did this um thing where I, I i went down the river thames with a bunch of men on boats dressed in red uniforms with swan's feathers stuck in their hats because i thought you know i want to look at brexit i want to look at brexit through the medium of going on the most recondite and eccentric English tradition of all time, which is swan upping. Um, I don't know if any of you know, but all the swans in Britain are owned by the Queen, of course, except the ones on the Thames, which are split between the Queen and two medieval guild companies. You know, Britain really is nuts like this, you know, it's quite a... So um, every year they have this, this sort of symbolic progress down the Thames in boats where they catch all the baby swans and they 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 actually you know decide who they belong to and I thought I've got to see this so I went along and um I kind of fell into this dream world of Englishness you know this sort of sense that um you know England really was this sort of amazing land of of sort of the you know World War II myths and kind of you know it, it was it was really strong and and and, and seductive and it ended up actually with, with me talking about um, this amazing thing that happened when the painter Stanley Spencer went to China in the 1950s. It's one of my favorite stories, this very eccentric English painter. Everyone on, the, on this delegation thought he was completely bonkers and they were very nervous of him speaking. And they went to this big uh, speech with the Chinese premier, Zhuang Lai, who stood up and gave this big speech on China and how important and how much he loved China. And then he said, what do you think of China to the British delegation? And, and to everyone's horror, Stanley Spencer, you know, this man in a raincoat stood up and said, um, have you ever been to Cookham, my village on the Thames? Have you ever been to Cookham? Do you know Cookham? <laughs> she realized like, no. And then he started talking about village life in England. And it was this astonishing moment because John Lai grew up in a village too. And they began to have this discussion about what it's like to grow up in a village, to look after your chickens, to talk to your neighbors. And it became this amazing diplomatic success, this, this finding of commonality in these tiny, tiny little moments. And I think that for me is one of the ways out of that question of the puzzle of nationalism and belonging is to look at the local, look at the small, because the smallest things are the things we really do share between people and those things are quite often natural history related things and that's i think one way out of the puzzle lovely lovely so tell us about your experience with goats yeah <laughs> do you want me to read it or should i just tell sure. you oh that'd be great warning there is cuss words in this. i can't believe my father i i sometimes think you know did is he, would he be angry that this was in here possibly <laughs> possibly uh, my dear father, the photographer, who, as many of you know, was the subject of uh, my first book, and the death was a great blow to me. Um, goats, right, here we go. I should know by now, shouldn't I? We're towards the end. I think I sort of softened up the reader by this point. Okay. As a child, I discovered a simple game that's good to play with goats. You lay your hand flat on a billy goat's forehead and push just a little. You push, and it pushes back and you push harder, and it does too. And it's a little like arm wrestling, but much more fun, and the goat always wins. I told my dad about my love of pushing goats once, and he just stood on the side, we were talking about something else. And he must have filed this information away, because about a year later, he came home very crossly, and he was cross with me, which is a very rare thing. In his capacity as a press photographer, he'd spent the day at London Zoo, um, taking photographs for their annual animal census. And at one point, he happened to be standing with the rest of the press pack in the petting zoo. And there, he saw a goat. And he says to everyone, watch this. And I hadn't explained the activity very well because he puts his hand against the goat's forehead with everyone watching. Then he pushes. He pushes really hard and the goat falls over. 
And there's this long silence broken only by the sound of photographers and journalists saying, Jesus, Mac, and what the fuck? And the goat gets up, stares at him, and runs away. And the press pack never let him forget the time he pushed a goat over in front of all of them. And it was all my fault. God, I still remember his face. I'm sorry, goat. I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you, Helen. I love that section. Well, um, as we uh, said at the beginning, uh, we will uh, love to entertain any questions from our viewing audience. I did see one in the chat uh, earlier um, asking, did you actually train the hawk that you talk about in H for Hawk? Yeah, falconry is astonishing. You know, it's, I've been a falconer for many, many years. Um, I got my first hawk when I was, uh, I don't know quite why FaceTime has just opened. It's my mother. How do they know? I told her I had an event at four. She just has this preternatural. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so falconry is odd. Falconry is very often thought of as this kind of weird way in which people sort of dominate and cow these wild birds. And anyone who's seen falconry close up knows that it is this astonishing dance of respect between two creatures. And I think the, you know, the writer Stephen Bodio, I think, the fol you know, astonishing writer, put it best once. He described falconry as the art of learning how to, be, how to be polite to a bird. So I've been a falconer for years. I'd flown many hawks, mainly falcons, which these beautiful dark eyed, in fact, they're quite related to parrots, never wanted to train a goshawk. Goshawks are, have this reputation as being kind of the Christopher Walkens of the bird's world. They're very highly strong, murderous creatures. And um, then my father died and I, I started dreaming of goshawks. And I think what I did was I, I, I decided to train this goshawk as a way of dealing with my grief because I knew I could train hawks. And I knew even then that grief was untamable, uncontrollable. And if you've read the book, you know, I, I, you know, I live with this bird and she was called Mabel. She was wonderful. And we, you know, I, she flew free and hunted her own food. And I went kind of a bit feral and a bit bonkers. And the story of that is the story of my first book, but absolutely I, I trained her right the way through. And in fact, you know, again, it was one of those lessons about how animals are more than we think they are. You know, I was led to believe that goshawks were a bit like feathered shotguns, but I used to play with her. I used to throw her bits of scrunched up paper and she'd catch them in her beak and throw them back to me. And I told my, you know, very sort of macho goshawk friends about this and they were horrified and said, you don't play with goshawks. And then I found out later they all did, but they just didn't want to talk about it. So, yeah, all, all, all me. Wonderful. Um, so let me see if there were any other questions that came up in the chat function. Um, well, certainly a lot of wonderful comments about your, your writing, Helen. Um, well, while I'm looking for more yeah. questions, um, can you share, oh, here's a question. What assisted you the most in writing your books? Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> Simple answer. Um, writing is a weird one, isn't it? Um, there are days, you know, anyone who writes knows there are days when it's a little bit like you're, you're wading through treacle full of broken glass. It's awful. It's almost impossible. You manage to get five or six words out. And then there are days where you feel you're kind of a golden god, you know, and you're like, you know, you can do anything. I'm the greatest writer in the world. It's ridiculous. And I think one of the one of the things that writing has taught me is that not to trust either of those. You know, the words you produce when you think that, that you're hopeless are generally almost indistinguishable from the ones that you produce when you think you're great. And, you know, you just have to keep going. Um, I don't believe there's a lot of writing advice on the internet. And I, I'm quite strongly against writing advice. I feel there are a million different ways to write. The only thing you have to do is do it. And um, one of the most important things for me was working with the New York Times magazine and my editor there. You know, I, you know, realized working with Sasha that writing isn't just a singular mind weeping over a keyboard, that collaboration and edit edit editorial input is really exhilarating. So, you know, I, I really love working with other people now. And um, that's really, really, really fun. But, you know, um, what have I learned? Funnily enough, the, the whole, I mean, not in terms of writing, but in terms of just the whole business of being a writer, I've learned to love people a lot more. I, you know, from touring, it's a weird life. You know, if you, you spend two years, you know, alone with your coffee and your keyboard, and then if the book does well, you tour. 
and you meet many, many people. And I always thought I was this introverted weirdo. And it turns out that, um, no, apparently I'm not. And of course, my book was about grief. So I met many people who talked about loss and about very dark times in their life. And it was a real lesson. You know, we all go through those times and we don't talk about them very often, but we are all such temporary creatures and we're very fragile. So that was a real, that was really very, very important and deep thing for me to learn. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I do see that there are a, quite a number of questions here, so I'm going to dive yeah. in. Um, the hawk brought you tranquility during changes in your life. What has helped you through this challenging year? I don't want to answer this because the answer is not what, what people want me to say. People want me to say that I've been going out every day, walking on the hills, you know, communing with nature in the forests. What's helped me through this, this year is friends on the internet, pints of ice cream and terrible action movies. Honestly, I'm not even joking. I have watched so many bad action movies. I'm like, um yeah i've retreated and 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 you know i have been going out into the into the wild quite a bit but but you know there's been a lot of times where i've really struggled and i live on my own and um i've been very lonely and i think you know the being able to talk with loved ones um through the internet is is basically what's kept me going i don't think Really Thank you for your honest answer and for sharing. You know, I think uh, a lot of people um, can relate to what you just said, and and you've now given permission. I think in a way for you know for people to feel not so great, and um, and it's okay. We're going to get through this, but uh, you're right. So here's a another question. I absolutely agree that science makes the world more beautiful. Was your background in ornithology? What drew you to birds especially? Great question. Big questions, great question. Um, it's always been birds. Um, and in one of these essays, I speculate a little bit about why. I, I had a twin brother who died just after he was born. It was a great tragedy for my parents. I knew nothing about it, of course. I was too small. And I was in an incubator for about a month after I was born. So a lot of solitude and loneliness and missing you know, this other entity, I think you know, very visceral sense of missing. And I think birds are, for me, tied up with that. Um, I compulsively looked for them when I was small, compulsively watched them, compulsively searched for them, and that's never really gone away. Um, they still seem to me among the most beautiful things the world has ever made. Um, what was the other bit about, the bit about, um, sorry, my, there was another uh, question. question. I'm sorry, you were asking about the question again? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'll read it again. So I absolutely agree that science mm. makes the world more beautiful. Mm -hmm. What's your background in ornithology and what drew you to birds especially? Okay, I've done the second part. Very personal. Um, no, I'm not an ornithologist. So I have had this. I think what's really driven me through life is I'm very easily bored um, and I'm very curious. And those two things are great, but also problematic when it comes to holding down steady careers. So um, I wanted to be a biologist for years. But I have no math. I can't do maths. Maths is not a particularly strong subject for me. So basically, I ended up doing an English degree. I, I discovered that there's a way of reading that isn't just about what the words say. It's about looking deeper and seeing in the books what's going on in the kind of cultures and societies at the time. And then I went off after my English degree and worked in falcon conservation in the Gulf states. And I kept seeing these Western conservation initiatives failing because they they failed to take into account the incredibly important um, cultural and emotional uh, weight of these falconry birds in, in, in Arab culture there. And I thought, oh, maybe I can look at nature and animals in the same way that I've been looking at books in my English degree. And that's why I went back to university and started a, uh, working in the history of science, which is an extraordinary subject. You know, it doesn't deny science as a way of looking at the world. Science is absolutely crucial. But what it does say is that the way that science, the questions we ask of the world, are inflected by the societies that we live in. And that's really, really, really important for not only the way I work, but I think the way forward in terms of um, you know, looking after what we have. So yes, I've never been a, a trained ornithologist, but I am the world's you know, saddest amateur naturalist and birder. I'm always out there when I'm not eating 
ice cream and what she actually needs. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I've got another great question here. Um, and you you talk you touch on this in the book a bit, uh, as I recall. Um, but the question is, do you prefer to experience nature alone or with others? Ooh, that's a good question. Both. So I know that's a measly, on, um, a sort of you know mealy mouthed answer. There are different things. I mean, I, I had, one of the things I love doing, and I think the essays are a little bit like that, is going out with people and sort of pointing things out and going, look, look, look. Do you know that I become a show and tell? I become a kid basically. Look at this pigeon egg. Do you know what this pigeon egg means? Let me sh tell you about this. Is you know being removed from the nest by the parents to stop predators. Or, you know, I do that. It's unbearable. Um, but one of the things about being with other people is quite often you can't see the things that you see if you're alone you know one of the, i i pride myself in being very quiet and very um i can get close to things and it's very hard to do that when you want other people so i i need both of those of, of ways of interacting with the natural world i think both people and alone but one of the things about being alone I think, is that you know um it, I talk a bit about this in the book, you know, the thing about nature is that it can't answer you back. You can look at the natural world on your own and it will just tell you exactly what you wanted to say. Other people can, can complicate that in really interesting ways. So I, I think there's also a, a, a good um, reason for, 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 for going out with other people just so that they can talk to you about what they're seeing and what that means to them. What came to mind when I saw the question was your passage on, uh, the phenomenon of of the uh, what do you call them the shields the the where where people will go to view wildlife in a in a in a box oh, basically yeah. and sort of the social interaction and the sort of the yeah. the, uh, cl oh, the class and yeah it was it was a great great piece yeah there's a great there's these bird blinds where you go to a bird reserve and they're like hunting blinds but like binoculars in them. I remember my, a friend of a dear friend of mine from Australia we went into a, this bird blind and um, she noticed that everyone was as far apart from everyone else as possible and she was trying to work out why and then she just realized they're just British people they don't want to talk to anyone else they just want to pretend no one else is there so yeah it's a really interesting interesting phenomenon this so Helen I think we might have time for one maybe two more questions um, uh, another uh, audience member asked who are some of your favorite naturalist writers? Oh my goodness, so many. Um, oh my goodness, I don't even know where to go. Wow, there are so many. Um, the book that I consistently returned to recently is J. Drew Lanham's The Home Place. Um, and if you've not read that, people, I cannot recommend it, you know, um, highly enough. It's um, the, uh, it's a book about being um, a black birder, a black ornithologist, about um, family history, about connections to place, about wonderment from the natural world. Um, Drew writes like a like an angel. It's it's an astonishing book, and also I think really important that, as everyone knows, traditionally the natural world has been you know writing about it has been the province of of you know pretty rich white men, and and I think it's just lovely that you know nature is a very various place and. So are the things that take us to it. It's really important that we have other voices now. So um, Robin Wall Camera, again, an amazing book. But there are other little known writers. There's an English writer called um, R.F. Langley, um, alas, no longer with us, who is best known as a poet, but he also wrote um, a series of journals that are published by a small publisher here, just called Journals, R.F. Langley. And he does something magical. He writes about the natural world and seeing creatures like ducks and seals and spiders and you know tiny insects crawling across bridges. And he uses those as springboards for these great kind of in, you know disquisitions about humanity and the world in a way that is just exhilarating and very very precise. So I love him. Um, Barry Lopez. I mean, there are many many people. Um, just uh, just you know grab hold of a corner of it and start start eating. Well put. Thank you for sharing, Helen. Uh, well, here's here's a, maybe the last question, and I don't know if this is a fair question to ask, but uh, what are you working on next? It's a good question. Um, we're slightly delayed, alas. So I'm very excited about this book. The next book is going to be another big nonfiction book. 
and it's about um, the end of the world, another cheerful subject, but hopefully there'll be jokes in it too. So basically it's about um, Midway Atoll in the Pacific Ocean, and I'm sure many of you will know about Midway. It was a naval air station for many years. Um, it's a tiny, one of the most remote places on earth, and it is absolutely full of albatrosses. Um, I managed to go there a couple of years ago as part of the Fish and Wildlife Service's albatross census and counted, helped count 667,000 albatrosses over a period of weeks. I used to go to bed at night dreaming of albatrosses. Um, it is the most astonishing place and it has this military history. It's a very you know, strategically important place and it's doomed with sea level rises. There's a whole um, question of plastic pollution there as well. Um, and then we have these birds that in the work of Coleridge and Baudelaire, you know, they really represent guilt and shame. And I think looking at environmental guilt and shame and me being a kind of middle-aged woman in the middle of her life, hopefully, um, and where we are now. So hopefully it's gonna be all sorts of things. And, um, but unfortunately I was meant to be there this last summer, but I couldn't go because of COVID. And I think they've canceled this summer too. So it might be a bit delayed, but I will produce it. I promise. And I'll be back before you know it with another long book. Wonderful. Well, you have many, many fans around the world and, and here in Tucson. Again, we so hope to see you in Tucson. So that's it for today, everyone. A special thank you to Helen for your participation today. And a thank you to all the readers for attending. Stay safe, be well, and keep reading. <laughs>